short readings. One is from the Tiwa Indians of North America. O oh, mother the sky, O oh, our mother the sky, O oh, our father, O oh, our mother the earth, O oh, our father the sky. Your children are we, and with tired backs we bring you the gifts you love. Then we for us a garment of brightness. May the warp be the white light of morning, may the weft be the red light of evening. May the fringes be the falling rain, may the border be the standing rainbow. Thus we for us a garment of brightness that we may walk fittingly where birds sing, that we may walk fittingly where grass is green. O oh, our mother, the earth, O oh, our father, the sky. So this is from the indigenous peoples of North America. And yet, if we go around the globe, we see some of the same honoring and respect for uh, Earth-centered beliefs from Rabindranath Tagore, whose uh, father actually came to this country to learn from and share his beliefs with Ralph Waldo Emerson, William Ellery Channing, and Henry David Thoreau. So Rabindranath Tagore, the same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. It is the same life that shoots in joy through the dust of the earth in numberless blades of grass and breaks in tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers. It is the same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and death in ebb and in flow. I feel my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life, and my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood this moment. So a few months ago, Teresa Pizzuto, our Director for Religious Education, and Meg MacArthur, our chair of the Religious Education Committee, and I sat to consider how we might integrate themes for worship services and learning for all ages. After conversations among various committees, we decided on an 18-month first Sunday exploration. That's a long time for us. <laughs> uh, hopefully we won't forget it by next year. Uh, First Sunday exploration of the development of religious and philosophical beliefs throughout human existence. This would help our children, youth, and adults explore on age-appropriate levels how the religious impulse developed over the millennia. Tomorrow, you're also invited to join Holly Ulbrich and me as we further explore the topic that, for this morning. The time and location are printed in your bulletin. So this morning we begin at the dawn of human history when humanity was struggling to survive. Standing erect and emerging from caves and trees. Just how and when religious sensibilities emerged is somewhat still a mystery, though over the last decade or so I've attended conferences in which scientists discuss their research on things such as the God spot in the brain, implying that we are somehow hardwired for spirituality. We now know that the oldest ruins that have been, dis uh, that have been discovered have been religious sites. Deep in the Kalahari Desert is a deep fissure in the earth where people have been worshiping for 50,000 years. High in the Andes, we find Machu Picchu. We find the Nazca Lines in the desert of Chile, which may or may not have been created by aliens. Depends on what you read. In Turkey, the remains of the oldest known buildings are thought to be a sacred site. These are amazing discoveries 
But it's our tendency as modern, educated people to consider these earliest belief systems to be primitive and not relevant to modern humanity. Yet a wise prophet once said, there is nothing new under the sun. We human beings forget and must learn over and over some of the insights that our forebears gained as they observed the world and found ways to live in awe of and in harmony with the natural world. How did humanity come to develop religious and philosophical systems of belief, and why? Because we are privileged to live in a part of the world where our lives are much less vulnerable than many peoples around the world, we can't truly comprehend what the world must have been like when our human ancestors began to try to understand who they were and their place in the midst of creation. Our sense of awe and wonder is sometimes diminished by our need to break down the composite parts of creatures and creation, forgetting the miraculous nature of amazingly complex creatures made of unknown numbers of pieces that work, that work. They work incredibly well together. Even when our complex bodies have aches and pains and as we age don't work the way we'd like to, it's miraculous that all those pieces work, whether it's a bacteria or a blue whale or a human being. Unlike our forebears, we rarely see a night sky bright with the Milky Way. Nor do we often fear the unknown dangers lurking outside our safe beds. I remember one time waking up in the middle of the night in the jungle in an area where there was no electricity to the noises of howler monkeys and other creatures that I didn't know what they were. And for just a few moments, like my heart and my whole reality went to that primal place and I realized how frightening the world must have been in the dawn of history. Imagine all those eons before technology, the vulnerability, the fear, the awe and wonder of being alive, the fragility of human existence in an often hostile world. And so those ancestors of our Ours did exactly what we try to do, find meaning. Human beings are, after all, creatures who need to make meaning of the world. To be able to cope with both the wonder and tragedy, we humans sought ways to make sense of the world. It was that way from the beginning. Some of their questions we still ask today. Why does a young mother have to die? Why do people suffer? How can we survive? Who is my enemy? Who is my friend? Will I have enough to eat and clean water to drink? These are profound questions. As we continued from those earliest days to make our place on earth and were able to focus on more than survival, New questions emerged, such as, what is love? What is my place in the world? How can I live with hope? How can I care for my family and tribe? In those early Earth-centered religions, these questions and more helped set into context humanity's connection to and relationship with the Earth. After all, how could these fragile creatures who were born and could not immediately run or climb or survive on their own, how could these creatures make their place in a creation filled with dangers for the weak or careless? It was their brains that helped them survive. 
And from their wondering came myths so that the stories might be shared from generation to generation. The framework and necessities for the physical, societal, and emotional survival. Myths from many traditions, and actually Laurel shared a story that was a myth from a, a, a tradition, continue to offer some answers for why there is suffering in the world, how we came into being, what happens if we disrespect the Earth's power. Taken in their underlying meaning, rather than as many people tend to do today, their literal meaning, these stories continue to hold powerful lessons for us. So we find early religious beliefs always connected to the cycles of the earth. Many of us in this congregation reverently hold beliefs that connect us to the seasons and the elements of nature, the earth, water, fire, and air. Even religions such as Judaism and Christianity have woven into their myths and rituals much earlier celebrations of the earth and her fertility. We see this most glaringly, and I think I've mentioned this before, in the name of God in the Abrahamic religions because their root word comes from a much earlier word, Enot, which was the name of the fertility goddess in old Canaanite. So how we came out with male-dominated religions from the mother goddess is a story in human history. Creation and its sacred unity survived as much more structured religions developed, even as those organized religions over the millennia sought to destroy indigenous religions and their wisdom. I believe that many of those beliefs continue to survive unacknowledged and embedded in millennia of myth because they hold power and ancient truths about who we are. It's important for us to rediscover some of the teachings of these earliest religious beliefs for we cannot survive on this earth without honoring our fundamental relationship to the natural rhythms and laws of nature. On September 28th, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Drew Lanham, an ornithologist, as our guest speaker. He's going to talk about his own exploration of his relationship with the natural world. The reality is that we are still creatures, animal creatures, held we're creatures held in an animal body. The rhythms of the tides, pulses in the fluids of our bodies, like Rabindranath Tagore said. Our reptilian brain holds our species memory of survival in an uncertain world. However much we call ourselves civilized or evolved, we are still bound by our relationship to the earth. Wherever we find ancient ruins, we find evidence of sacred practices in caves deep underground and in the highest mountains. Those of us who have watched recent natural devastations around the world have seen the impact of our abuse of nature as well as the consequences of natural law. While our vulnerability as a species is often diminished, by our advances, we find that ultimately nature to which the earliest religions were tied still controls life and death. It is important, therefore, that we don't dismiss the early earth-centered focus on religious and spiritual beliefs as simply primitive. The myths that emerged alongside our earliest human history were not simply superstition, but frequently offered human beings wisdom about how to live in harmony with the natural world. 
I find it personally fascinating that as we learn more from science, we discover a connection between many ancient beliefs and practices and new scientific discoveries. Krillian photography can now show energy fields and auras of a person's body. Think all those halos around those angels. The scientific discoveries about different planes of reality help us see some of the shamanic practices in indigenous traditions with new eyes. Our government's research on remote viewing connects us to ancient religious practices of shaman who could see other places. We now, not like it was when I was much younger, but we now accept as tradition ancient practices such as acupuncture and toning, which is similar to sonograms, which use sound to heal. Some ancient beliefs in modern, so, so ancient beliefs in modern science need not be a discord. We find traditional sacred healing plants that people have known for thousands of years. They're modern medicine. We call them modern without giving credit to the ancients who understood their power. Yes, we are finally coming to understand that the ancients understood more about reality than we've thought. Yes, there can be, there has been great misuse of superstition, but much wisdom has been lost over the centuries when ancient practices were repressed or completely discounted. Another important aspect of our continued connection to Earth-centered religions is our need to find peace and harmony in the world. I think people are longing for that. I don't think it's unusual that we now have three meditation groups that meet every week in our congregation. Over the years, I've been in, a, in numerous workshops during which there is some kind of meditation where the participants are asked to focus during their meditation on a place where they feel peace and calm. When they then are later asked, where did you go in that meditation? The wide majority is a special place in nature. A place where they could feel peaceful and grounded. So actually, there's scientific proof for why we should be tree huggers. The physical connection to the earth is thought to literally bring healing and peace. This deep visceral knowledge makes us worry about our children who are often nature deprived. From where will they learn to find peace and to understand their connection to the earth? So at this point, I need to interject, interject a bit of cosmic humor about this sermon. The last few days didn't quite unfold the way I thought they would, so yesterday I was working on my sermon, and at least it wasn't 2 a.m. on Sunday morning. So, you know, the question is, what happens when a busy minister is still working on her sermon about earth-centered spirituality and, and writing about the power of nature? lightning strikes, literally. How many jokes do we have about lightning striking a Unitarian Universalist for some cosmic sin? I'll start working on tomorrow's sermon tomorrow. I mean, next Sunday's So here I was sitting, thinking, and typing, and I heard a little bit of thunder and a little bit of lightning, and I thought, Oh, I wonder if I should turn off the computer, but it's not very close. It's pretty far away. 
So then, as I was literally writing about the vulnerability that human beings have in relation to nature, there is this freak, loudest clap of thunder I've ever seen and a ball of light right outside my door. I did not see Jesus. I did, however, think I'd been hit, but know my high-tech modem that connects me to the world wide web of existence, which was connected to a surge protector and had all my research notes, was blown out by Mother Nature. You know, you can't plan things like this. So after being freaked out, I was like, you know, this is really funny. So um, my event reinforced what we're trying to talk about today. And it reinforces that even Unitarian Universalists need to remember from whence we come and to live with awe. And the modem will be replaced tomorrow. So where do we find threads of these earth-centered religions in our modern UU fabric? When our principles, purposes, and sources were crafted, they sought to weave together the ways in which we Unitarian Universalists find meaning. Very wisely, our last principle reminds us that we are connected to the interdependent web of existence. This principle both reminds us of our connection to nature and also connects us to other people's cultures and traditions. This principle reflects the foundational belief of most ancient and, re and indigenous peoples around the world. Whether we explore Native American spirituality or aboriginal beliefs from Africa to Australia, the core belief is that we are all connected within one sacred reality. We live and breathe as part of one creation. What befalls one befalls all living beings. As we look at our world, we human beings will hopefully finally realize that this is a truth we must claim for the survival of our species in the earth. This is why one of, our source, one of the sources of our faith has always been a respect for the world's religious traditions. Within our own heritage, we can certainly look at the way of life that people still have in our religious homeland of Transylvania. And we see that they live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. It was the transcendentalists, however, who most clearly marked Unitarians as a religion that would remain deeply grounded in earth-centered spirituality. Emerson and Thoreau, two of the most read readers in this culture, articulated their philosophies within the context of the natural world. They, like we, wrote of their search to find ways to connect beyond ourselves and our small existence to honor our place within creation. Emerson was in awe of nature, and the beginnings of transcendentalism became part of his thinking when he took a sailing ship from this country to Europe. And in the wide expanse of water and sky, he found solace from some grief in his life and a connection to his place of creation. He came to understand, as our forebears did, we are tiny creatures in the vastness of creation. That rock from Normandy was there long before human beings slaughtered each other on that beach. That is the truth of our existence. We are tiny creatures in the vastness of creation. Our task in this life is to find meaning and courage for living with whatever chances and changes befall us. So in a sense, we are 
still in harmony with our ancient sisters and brothers. We are still creatures who seek to find meaning in our lives. We still seek to find both our roots and our wings. When we lose touch with that ancient quest, we put our generation and future generations at risk. We would do well to honor creation as did our ancestors. I invite us now to rise in body or spirit as we share our closing hymn.